Pervert Pearl and his false Aleister Crowley gospel. Uh, yeah, uh, this guy is wicked. Absolutely wicked. Uh, I came out with a video on him years ago. I'll show that here in a minute. But this most recent video here, I saw it come up in my feed of you might be interested in thing, and I, and I just kind of whatever, you know, I don't care. And it just the Lord really impressed it on me. I need to watch this thing, see what he's saying. What is this fool gospel? Total heresy, just wicked. The reason I call him a pervert is because if you don't know who this guy is, uh, they write a lot of things on uh, marriage and counseling and things like this. That's how he's made all of his money. And um, here he has a video right here, holy sex and and uh, and just total pervert. They have a sex manual. Basically, the people have jokingly called it the uh, Christian Kama Sutra. It's wicked. But they were both pure and everything. Never had an impure thought. And they didn't look at pornography or anything else. You know, they're pure until the time that they were married, and then they get married, and they do just write about their fornication or their well, not fornication if they're married, but they're just write about their sexual stuff and get into all different types of practices and yeah okay whatever but that's not the main thing you know, I've known about this guy for a long time probably 20 years I've known about Michael Pearl um, and it just kinda you know, whatever you know but uh, years ago I did a video I'd gotten this little I found a um, little comic book thing that Michael Pearl put out um, at a used bookstore and I was reading through it and I, I did a video in May of 15th 2016 you can see it right here and uh, he has Eve saying he said we can eat of every tree except this one but if we touch it we will die that's not what she said that's not what it says in the King James Bible it is beautiful to look upon and it does look like it would be good for food and it will make me wise to eat it but God said not to eat this fruit that's gee, Eve never said that okay this is adding to scripture you say what's well, in a comic book it's harmless it's whatever uh, no that's not right you're adding to the scriptures and then over here he has uh, no discovered that by putting fruit in a container and leaving it for a few weeks it made an alcoholic drink that caused him to feel funny Noah got to liking the drink so much that at times he couldn't work he would just fall down unconscious it made him do things that displease God there's no scripture for that he got drunk in his tent but it doesn't say that he knew how to do this and that's what he was just like and to get he just became an alcoholic or something that's nonsense and there's Noah's wife you know she's glaring you know like a good modern woman would do or something or my stupid husband you know what an idiot there's no scripture for this none but uh, we'll, we're going to go through this whole thing because it's extremely important there's a few parts I might skip it gets into baptism and whatever else but it's very important this is a just total false gospel right and I've been thinking this for a long time I thought uh, a lot of these devils, they knew that that uh, if they go, you know, I don't go after new version people because you should be uh, wise to the fact that if they're using new versions, they're just false. Just don't even waste your time on them. But the guys that come out and they say, I'm a King James Bible believer. Okay, now you're into my realm. Okay, that's not that I control the Bible believing movement, far from it. But what I'm saying is, you're pretending to be somebody like me. So I'm going to watch what you're doing and watch what you're saying. And if you're false, I'm going to go after you period and expose you that's what, that's what Paul did in Acts chapter 20 okay ceasing not to warn the brother night and day with tears about the false prophets out there that's what I do that's what I've done for many years and I thought we'll see what happens here but if I go off of YouTube then these devils will probably start to come out of the woodwork with all their false gospels and everything else okay um, there are devils there are ministers of Satan that they can learn to say the right things but you'll see them, they'll go off when it comes to the gospel because their real true purpose and goal is to damn people to hell with them. They want to bring as many people to hell with them as they can. So let's watch this video here. Ads, of course. He doesn't have a problem with monetization, but everybody's monetized now because of Wrong YouTube. Six. Okay, so let's go here. I'm going to put this on a mini player right there. Okay, well, let me do that. Um, I'm going to put the scriptures up right here so we can actually follow along. Again, another.
big warning sign with these guys uh, that they come out and they'll say, um, you know, uh, the Bible says this, the Bible says that. They won't tell you to turn. And you'll see he does not tell people to turn in the Bible. It's a very bad thing to get into here. Let's go back to the beginning of this. Okay, let's play it. In Jesus Christ, not only are we saved, but we're sanctified. I discovered that the full gospel is the gospel of salvation and sanctification in one package. Salvation and sanctification in one package. Chapter and verse. No scripture given. Okay. Uh, there's no scripture there. So uh, what he's trying to say is that, you know, I'm just going to spoil the surprise. So uh, as you could say it. Uh, he's trying to say when you get saved, you're immediately sanctified. You now you're declared sinless, righteously sinless, and boom, you can do whatever you want in your life, and it doesn't matter. You no longer sin. You can't sin anymore. Uh, well, in terms of imputed righteousness, that's true. In, as far as when you get saved, now what you've done in the past uh, is washed away, certainly. But if you sin in this life, you will pay for it. And you will see he just comes right out and calls out a false gospel. Very important to expose this devil. Watch this. So with a short bit of time, what would I like to say to you? Over the years, there's been several major truths that I have personally discovered. Not that they did, other people didn't know them, but I discovered them for myself. Things that have made tremendous difference in my life. One of those things I discovered when I was pastor about 24, 25 years old of Southside Baptist Church, where my wife was a member and where I met her and married her. I... Uh, we had an evangelist come for a week's meetings, and he preached a typical Baptist doctrine uh, in such a way that it brought depression upon the church. You can't have uh, anybody preach anything that might cause people to look at themselves as sinners. You know, he doesn't really clarify too much of what the guy was or who he was or whatever else, but, you know, yeah, you don't want to have a preacher... You know, preach to you and, and make it cause depression or anything. You know. What a devil. And he was teaching repent from sin in a way that was not biblical. He was preaching uh, dealing with your sin in a way that was not biblical. And so when he, he, when he left there, I started a study on what is salvation. Now, you understand, I had, I had preached in most of the towns in Missouri and Arkansas, revival meetings, and seen hundreds of people saved mm -hmm. by that time. I'd had a ministry on the street and seen thousands of people saved. And I had preached uh, uh, usually somewhere between 10 and 15 times every week. And I'd finished Bible college and studied Greek and did all the things that you do. So it wasn't like I was a novice at this point. But... I started back at the beginning and I asked, what is salvation? So I worked on it for about eight or nine months and I prepared, I believe it was 86 pages of notes. And I dealt with the subject of what is sin, what is free will or is there a free will? Those are important questions. And then I dealt with what is faith? What is belief? Who can believe? What does it take to believe? What's God's part? What's my part? What's repentance? What do I have to do? Repent of what? Repent to what? How much? How thorough? Is it just grief? Is it sorrow? Is it stop doing it? Uh, I mean, when you say somebody you need to repent, are, are you saying they need to stop sinning before they get saved? Are you saying they need to want to stop sinning or be sorry they're sinning? Exactly what are you saying? Well, all those things are said by somebody at one time or another. I want to know what does the Bible say. And so what is faith? And, and uh, then uh, what do you do to be saved? And 
are you saved forever or short term or what? I mean, these were major questions that that still different theological persuasions have different sides on the view, you know. And so I had 86 pages of notes and I started Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. We didn't have Sunday school. And I preached till noon. We broke for an hour's meal. I preached all afternoon till 5. We broke for a meal and I preached that night till 10. So it was a little over eight hours of constant preaching, and most of the people had left by the time I got through. through. And I didn't finish up, so I finished up the next week in another three hours. So it was about uh, 11 hours to get through those notes and to preach that. But I, I, I developed great clarity on all those issues in, the, in my study. But then the question arose, what is sanctification? What do you those issues came up as I was making the first study, but I didn't want to deal with that at that point. So I discovered something. I discovered that I discovered that Jesus Christ did something for me before I was born, did something on my behalf before I was born. I was not there, but he died to make an atonement for my sin before I was born. He did that on the cross on my behalf for me. Now that's fine if you understand. Of course, obviously, Jesus would have died, you know, nearly 2,000 years ago. Obviously, before he was born, before I was born. Fine. But it's yeah, kind of leaning a little bit hyper-Calvinistic. You know, predestination, the whole thing. And you'll see later on why I'm saying that. A lot of these heretics, they'll take the whole, the heresies of of tulip calvinism total depravity un unconditional election limited atonement irresistible grace irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints or predestination you can say it either way they'll take that and they'll they'll kind of refine a little bit and they'll come out with something else and see if god shows you for salvation then that means that you're saved regardless of what you do to get saved he unconditionally elects you through his irresistible grace, you can't res resist it. He just, boom, he saves you. And all you have to do is just believe, see? And then after that, well, it doesn't matter what you do after that because you're forced into salvation. So, uh, you know, and they, it's really weird and bizarre. And they'll take little snippets of it and they'll kind of form it and remold it into their own system. And you'll see it's exactly what he does. Let's continue. That's the gospel most of us know. But the full gospel, not the gospel of healing or tongues, but the full gospel is that not only did Jesus die for me, but I died with him. Okay, the full gospel. Full gospel. Sorry, no matching verses found in the King James Version. Full gospel is not in there. Hmm. Well, it's, it's there, it's just not actually as a title. It's just kind of like the Trinity thing or something. <laughs> Let's see about that. I was put to death when Jesus died on the cross. He not only terminated the record of sin against me, he actually terminated the sinner, me, when he died. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Um, so now he's no longer a sinner. Hmm. So uh, this is the Church of the Nazarene. A lot of these guys have come out with this sinless perfection type of a thing. Now that I'm saved, I, I don't sin anymore. It's not possible. I don't sin. <laughs> uh, that's what these guys do. But this pervert here, he takes it into a whole different angle, and that is that uh, you don't even have to worry about crucifying the flesh. There's no such thing as fighting against sin and whatever else. You'll hear him say it here coming up. Um, there's no war with the flesh. There's no... I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, 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 no. So you have the two different branches of these Satanists. You have the Jesse Moore in hell, the Team Jesus, the street preachers that they say, if you're sinning, if you, you know, it's one thing to struggle with sin, but you know, it's kind of a, a venial sin. But if you if you have major sin in your life, then that's mortal sin, <laughs> Catholic. Uh, and, and therefore, you're not really saved. If you have any sin in your life, you have to be sinlessly perfect it's obedience that brings you to salvation 
That's a false gospel. But then the other side of the coin, the satanic coin of Satan's ministers is that they say, you don't even worry about sin anymore. You just go on to live your life. All your sins are paid for. Jesus suffering and dying on the cross, you don't even have to think about that anymore. Oh, he died for my sin? Oh, good, cool. Okay, I'm going into the strip club now to watch the thing and get drunk. See? That's what these guys believe. People like this. Let's continue. You'll see what I'm saying. That this problem I have, which is my flesh, flesh is the source of all of our sin. That the problem I have, this flesh, was crucified when he was crucified. So that when Jesus died on the cross, there wasn't just one man dying on the cross. The entire body of Christ, the church, all who are his, died on the cross at the time he died. And when he was buried in the grave, all of us were buried in the grave with him. And when he was resurrected, all of us were resurrected at the same time. And when he ascended, we ascended. When he was seated, we were seated. As he reigns, we reign. That is my reality. He can be his gods. Oh, nothing to that. But um, boy, I sure am glad. I mean, he's really proven his point here by saying, turn in the Bible. Let me show you here. Let me show you. Why isn't he telling people to turn in their Bibles? And you say, well, but brother, we are buried with him. And I, I know, I know, I know what the scriptures say. But you see, he put in a lot of other stuff there that the scriptures don't say. And again, what he's doing is he's saying, okay, in terms of eternal salvation, yes, you don't need to get resaved every single time you sin. Okay, that's, that would be a false gospel. But what he's doing is he's saying the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ that comes upon you, that takes your record and makes it clean and says, okay, you're heading to heaven when you die, you have eternal security. He takes that then and he says, okay, that's sanctification. You no longer have to even worry about sinning. Just go on, live your life, do whatever you feel like doing. Huh. What did he say here? Alistair Crowley, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. No connection there. Let's continue. Now, it's a big leap to go from saying that to seeing it as a reality for this cause we do not see feel or experience that that i just said in our own lives in other words i can't look at myself and say my flesh is dead that's why all these false doctrines come up about dying to yourself about crucifying yourself about uh, putting off the old man uh, this conversation, my old man made me do it. Or it's my sinful nature made me do it. All these different excuses, Romans 7, people use for... Okay, um, that's all false doctrine. That's all false stuff, you know. Crucify in your flesh and, and whatever else there. Um, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Um, false doctrine? I don't think so. It's what Paul wrote. Colossians chapter, whoop, Colossians chapter 3. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now you also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. What's the point of instructing anybody to fight against sin? Why even mention sin after, do you believe Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins? Okay, boom, done, you're into heaven, go on, live however you want. See, it's, it's just wicked what this guy's doing. I think here, Galatians chapter 5, he'll mention this here in a little bit too. Galatians chapter 5, uh, about, you know, this I say, then walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth, lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. 
and these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. You know? Um, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God in Romans 14 is peace and love and joy in the Holy Ghost, I believe it is. You're supposed to put down your members, right? That's, you know, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. We're supposed to have a fight against sin. And one of the strongest ones, which is absolutely great for instruction and righteousness, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Like Michael Pearl. <clears throat> and there's so many scriptures. What's the deal with all the Pauline epistles just going after sin and you need to stop this, you need to stop that, that and fighting this and Let's go to Romans chapter 7 because that's where this pervert now goes and, and he's getting into the thing. You know, and he doesn't even quote the scriptures correctly. You'll see that. You know, again, he's not telling him to, to go there and turn there. It just, you know, I'm just going to quote it from memory and he doesn't even quote it correctly. Look at this right here. It says, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he says, flesh. You know, watch, watch what he says. excuse. To say that which I would, that do I not. That which I would not, that do I. If I do that I would not, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this flesh? I thank God with the flesh I serve the law of sin, as a good Baptist. And with the spirit I serve the law of God. Uh, what? Serve the Lord with, or with the, the flesh I serve the law of sin, as a good Baptist. The Apostle Paul writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. You blasphemer. Right there. How's a good Baptist? Paul wasn't a Baptist. What a pervert. Continue. And so people have fallen back into an excuse that the flesh, this old man they call it, this sinful nature they call it, keeps dragging me back into sin, so my life is a battle against this flesh, against this sinful nature, to put it to death, to subdue it, to overcome it. So we fast, we pray, we read the Bible, we meditate, we go to meetings, we do all of these things to try to subdue this sinful self dwelling here, to try to overcome him and live in the spirit rather than in the flesh. That's a false gospel. <clears throat> That's a false gospel. You're going to hell. If you don't, I mean, again, oh, there's certain things that he says about this and that, whatever, you know, whatever. I don't care. This is just plain teaching of Scripture. If there's no struggle between your flesh and your spirit and your soul, if there's no struggle there, if you can't agree with Paul when he says, a oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death, not flesh, like devil boy here said. If you can't agree with the Apostle Paul, then you don't understand biblical salvation. But see, that's what these lost peoples all get into this thing. Oh, oh, well, I just, I believe I didn't have to call upon the Lord to be saved. And I just believe that I'm saved. And, and now I just live however I want. I don't want some preacher coming down on my sins. It makes me feel bad. It ruins my day. Yeah, that's what lost people say. Lost people think that way. Hellbound false prophet Michael Pearl. But it's the primary gospel that's understood by the church today. What I discovered was there's something much more miraculous and wonderful than that. Well, I'm sure. That Jesus Christ put me to death. Now, I've gone out on the street and I've said to a guy, Jesus died for you. And he said to me, I didn't ask him to. My response was, he didn't ask you if you wanted him to. He just died for you. He said, but I don't care. I said, but he still cares. But I don't believe it. Well, I believe it, and he believes it, 
You're the only one who doesn't believe it. He said, but I just, I don't even want to hear it. I said, well, I don't really want to be out here telling it, but he told me to. So I'm out here telling you that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. Now, I've had people get saved after leading into a conversation like that. I just don't quit. I keep telling them. I just don't quit. Oh, uh, well, then you're not doing it the Bible way. You know, how many times did Jesus tell his disciples, you go into a city and if they don't receive you, shake off the dust of your feet and go someplace else. Oh, no, man, I'm just there. I'm going to keep on just pounding them until they until I get that profession of faith, until they find say, yeah, okay, I believe. I believe. Just leave me alone. That's Jack Hiles. That's all this is. High pressure, door-to-door -door salesman, gospel presentations. Oh, I've led thousands to the Lord. No, you haven't. No, you have not. I've seen the practical application of that thing. I've gone door to door and seen that you know we did it the right way. And and if they're not saying, hey, I understand I'm a sinner and yeah, I'd really like to be saved. I, I want to know what the Bible says and whatever. If we don't see that, okay, see you. Hey, I, I'm not interested. I don't want to hear. Okay, do you understand? And get off my door. Okay, all right, fine. We're leaving. I'm not going to pressure anybody. I've known Christians that were pressured into a decision and whatever else. They didn't get saved. They said they got saved later on. They finally came to the end of themselves and then they get saved. They say, okay, Lord, I'm a sinner. Please save me. And God saves them. But the high pressured thing, that's not saving anybody. That's what these guys do. They go out and they brag about their numbers that they got saved. I got thousands of saved, you know, whatever. He's a false preacher. It doesn't matter what you believe or what you think. It's happened. It's a reality. He died for you. Now, you know, when that guy gets saved is when he believes that fact without seeing it, without experiencing it, without touching it, without finding it inside, without discovering it's his experience. When he believes outside of himself that that Jesus Christ is a reality, he's born again. So it's all about his intellect. Same thing with Robert Faker Breaker, Pale Eddie Edward Fenninger, uh, all these false prophets out there. Only believe. There's no prayer needed. You don't have to ask God to save you or whatever else. No. You know when you get saved? When God saves you. Grace through faith. You have to have faith that Jesus died on the cross. You have to believe, certainly. But it's God's grace that has to come down. God is the one that does the saving. And you know how you get his uh, salvation? Ask him. Ask him because you believe what the Bible says and you call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Like, like the Bible plainly teaches, you know, plain English. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. It's plain. It's simple. Been proving that thing for years and years. But these false prophets come along and they say, well, actually, call upon the name of the Lord does not mean to ask. It means to believe from the heart. <laughs> okay, so there's two beliefs then in, in you know, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. Just ridiculous. But see, again, it's all about you. And if you, hey, you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins, great, fine. Go on, do what you want. Perverted gospel. It's a false gospel. Continue. In other words, by faith, he lays hold of a reality based on the words of God, not based on his experience. Now, if you tell him you're going to feel it, and then he get him an emotional experience, he feels it, then he looks at the feeling, he said, that's the proof. And that's a bad, bad way to have confidence in your salvation. Uh, so I come now to a Christian, a Christian who's struggling in sin. And he says to me, I can't overcome sin. And my statement to him is, you've already overcome sin. His statement is, but I, I'm weak. My statement to him, Jesus says, you're strong. He said, but the flesh is acting up. My answer is, Jesus says, your flesh is dead. You've been buried. You've been raised. Notice he's not having them turn in the Bible. Dead giveaway. It's a dead giveaway. And he's twisting the scriptures. There are some parts of what he's saying that are true. You are buried with Christ. That's true. You should walk in new, newness of life. We'll see here how he changes the scriptures coming up again. But you see what he's doing. You see why I stress to people, I hold the King James Bible in my hands and I say, if you turn next to 
this verse, turn to this verse, turn to this verse. You had better get into the habit of reading in your Bible. I don't care who you're following along with. You get your King James Bible up and you read it and you look at it. And if they're not telling you to do that, there's a reason for it. You're on the right hand of God. You are free from sin completely and altogether and totally. He says, but I don't feel it. And I said, that doesn't change the facts. Doesn't change the facts. His sanctification begins when he believes that which he cannot see, has not yet experienced, believes it to be a reality based on what God said, not what he thinks or feels or experiences. Now that sets a man free from sin. He says it three times in Romans 6. He that is dead is freed from sin. He says, therefore, 6, Romans 6, what should we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin? Now, God says as a Christian. He's going to avoid that little term there. Uh, live any longer therein. That's saying you're not supposed to live in sin. You no longer have to have that temptation. You no longer can say, well, I don't have anybody to help me overcome these sins. Now the Holy Spirit of God has moved into your life and you can have that power there to fight those sins. I mean, how does a, a porn addict have any power of themselves? You need to have the Holy Spirit of God come into you when you get saved and then he can help you to get victory over that sin. How does a drunkard get victory over the sin of alcoholism? Go down through the list. You say, well, I know sinners that have got, yeah, but then they'll get messed up some other place. You need the Holy Spirit of God to come into your life to help you fight sin. Not just to say, well, the Holy Spirit's there and he doesn't really even convict me of sin. That's so weird. Just so stinking screwed up. Let's continue to listen to this heretic. You are dead to sin. The Bible said that Abraham believed God. God who uh, calls those things which be not as though they were. God calls those things which be not as though they were. God called Abraham the father of a great nation when he wasn't. Abraham believed he was the father of a great nation when he had no children and he didn't have a body to produce seed and his wife couldn't receive the seed. Abraham believed what? He believed God. He was believing words outside his experience. You see, he, he didn't pull faith down or, or reach up with faith and get a hold of the power of God or the energy of God or the spirit of God to come down and energize him to do something by faith. That's not what happened. He believed something that was already a reality in God's thinking. Are you following me? He believed a reality that God declared. And in doing that, it worked out in his experience. So the reality I'm declaring to you in this brief time is that you are dead and freed from sin. That you are buried, raised, alive unto God, and seated on the right hand of God, and free altogether. Shall we continue in sin? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin living longer there? And know you not, as so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Our newness of life is because we were baptized into his body and then buried with him. Now what does that mean, baptized into his body? Okay, um, we should walk in newness of life. Now he goes off on the whole thing of seven different baptisms and whatever else. Um, so we also should walk in newness of life. So, but you have a new life according to this devil right here. Just, you know, boom, you have a new life. find it interesting too, by the way, is this hypnotism wheel right here. <laughs> That's appropriate. But uh, as a Christian, you're supposed to walk in newness of life. And I understand that there are Christians that don't. I understand that there are Christians that continue in sin and they, they just get all messed up and everything else. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die. Okay, um, you're supposed to walk in newness of life, though. You're supposed to have a uh, sanctified life. And it doesn't come at salvation for crying out loud. It takes years sometimes. If you're messed up, porno pornography addiction, uh, cigarette smoking, drug addiction, alcohol, rock music, name it. That stuff takes years. 
I am never going to be hard on I'm, I have I have talked to people that are just wicked looking and drugs and everything else but they just got saved and they're excited about the things of the Lord and whatever else I'm not going to look at them and say well you know I don't think it took with you no, I don't do that I look and I say do they have the spirit of truth what is their testimony or do they have a desire to change where they're at right now do they want help in getting victory over sin yeah but to say oh no sanctification just happens right at the same time as salvation that is stupid that is heresy total heresy oh well you just don't care about your sins that you're you know that brought you to the cross you you understand that Jesus died for your sins and there should be some guilt there he had to die a terrible death for your sins but then you get saved and you don't care about the sins anymore how in the world does that work but I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit because he just goes off on the thing of baptism and it doesn't matter you know seven baptisms and whatever else it's not relevant to the thing here us we became part of Christ that baptism didn't happen when you went in the water that baptism happened the moment the Holy Spirit saved you, born you again, and you were placed into the body of Christ. The baptism in water, a different baptism comes later. Now, it's interesting. Hebrews says, uh, leave, uh, see, 6 1, leaving therefore the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, and the doctrine of, the doctrine of, singular, doctrine singular, of, baptisms plural many baptisms a doctrine you say well it's the baptism of the Holy Ghost yes there's the baptism of the Holy Ghost which is when the Holy Spirit comes upon us as it did on the day of Pentecost but it is the baptism when God baptizes us into the body of Jesus Christ and makes us one now one of those baptisms saves and the others do not one of them is the real and the other one are pictures of it so which one is the real? If you think it's water baptism, then you're making a mockery of the realities. It is not water baptism. It's the baptism into the body of Christ. Now, back to our text here. Just we'll finish pretty quick. And he just goes off on the baptism thing there for a while. It, it doesn't you know, change what the majority of what he's saying there. But back to the thing here. Back to Romans. Six, for by one spirit all are baptized into one body, whether it be Jew or free, bond or free, free, so forth. If we've all we have all been planted, we've all been planted together. Now, companion planting, you take two seeds and you put them in the ground together. When Jesus was planted in the earth, he said, "You were planted with him." Been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this. That our old man is crucified with him. So the old man is not some part of you, like a sinful nature or something, which does not exist. The old man is all that you were, body, soul, spirit, memory, intellect, will, everything that was you as a man before you came to Christ. That's the old man. <laughs> body, soul, spirit, and everything, that's the old man before you came to Christ. <laughs> Okay. The new man is all that you are now since you came to Christ. When did the old man cease? When he was crucified. The old man was crucified, went into the grave, and a new man came out. You don't have two men now. You don't have Okay, uh, so what happens at the catching up of the body of Christ? This corruptible shall put on incorruption? This mortal shall put on immortality? Corruptible flesh? Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? See how obvious this guy is. It just that's why I'm saying, you know, we're not even talking about, well, it's just some minor difference. This is just blatant, false teaching right here. Yes, you do still struggle with sin. Yes, you do still do really stupid things as a Christian. I mean, that who are you trying to kid, Michael Pearl? I mean, my goodness. Other than a bunch of lost people that don't want any conviction of sin because it's depressing. I mean, my goodness. 
anybody who's saved just sees right through this thing and just says, yeah, right. <laughs> I know what it's like when I sin. I know how I feel terrible and guilty and everything else. An old man, new man. You don't need to overcome the old man. You can't put the old man to death. He's already died. He doesn't exist anymore. Oh, any more than Christ's body exists in a natural state anymore. The Bible said, henceforth know we him no more after the flesh. He'll never be that again. He's now glorified. So you and I were died with him, buried with him, raised with him, ascended with him, and seated with him. That's our reality according to God. And he says, our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is uh, freed uh, from uh, sin. Oh, 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 just jump to the next verse there, heretic, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Henceforth, you get saved, and now you go out into the future. The process of sanctification as a Christian. You're not supposed to serve sin as a Christian. That's what Romans chapter 6 is all about. It's saying, hey, you don't have to have this, this tie to the sinful past that you've had. You now have the Holy Spirit so that you don't have to serve sin in the future. The process of sanctification, you're supposed to get victory over certain sins. Clean up your life. Oh, no, that all happens, right, when you get saved and nothing changes. <laughs> okay. You know, just I love how these, these false devils will do this. Something that just clearly disproves what he's saying here. And just, whoop, read it quick. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Wait a second there, you stupid devil. Why don't you go back to verse 6 and read the last part there that just overthrew what you're trying to teach. I am dead. We sing a song. I am dead, I am dead. I am dead and my life is hidden with Christ and God. It's no longer I who lives. Jesus lives inside of me. I am dead and my life is hidden with Christ and God. You ever sing that song? Should have. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive and I got my life from Jesus Christ. You, you, you never sang that song? I probably won't try it after hearing me do it. Uh, knowing that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free. First of all, we should not serve sin. <laughs> henceforth we should not serve sin. Get through that quick there. That spirit that's in you, that sinful, wicked, devil spirit that's in you, doesn't want to talk about, henceforth we should not serve sin. From sin, If we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being dead, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, and he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, in the same manner, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead, Indeed, not in symbol, not in form, indeed, unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that's Romans chapter 6, just a part of it. I well then what out, why don't we read some more there? How about verse 12? Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Hello. Um, why not uh, read that? Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Just kind of missed that part there. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. All sin is negative. Show me one sin that's good for you. All sin is negative. Why on earth would you have somebody that says, I'm a Christian and I can just sin without any conscience? And it goes down through. I mean, you can just go after over scripture after scripture after scripture. We're supposed to crucify the flesh. There's supposed to be a war there. If that war's not there, you're not saved. Let's continue with a stupid heretic here. Uh, we, there's more there. It will take you to 8 and go even further. Go to Ephesians and take give you some more. Go to Galatians. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Colossians has got some on it. In fact, Paul's epistles are full of this. This is his message. Now, I know it's been overlooked. It's been made to be something other than what it is. But it's right there in your face, bold and plain, that you, as a believer, do not have a 
a sinful self, an old self, a, a, a corrupted self, a, a flesh. And you say, but my flesh, I know it's not dead. See, I, I've got it right here. God says it is. So what, what you're up against is what you see or else what you believe. That's where faith comes in, just like the guy on the street, believing that Jesus died for him when he's got no evidence except the words of God. And when you can believe that, you begin to experience that freedom from sin that you've always wanted. That's freedom from sin that you always wanted. Oh, you mean freedom from conviction of sin? You devil, you. Hey, you can go to Romans 8. Well, let's look at Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Praise hallelujah. We can just sin as much as we want to now. There's no condemnation. Yay. It's, we've been, dead, you know, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And now, you know, we died with him. And so, hey, we, we no longer sin in this life. We don't have to pay for sin. Now, that's not what the verse is saying. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. There is condemnation to you if you mess around with the flesh. And if you sin, you say, well, I just thought, I don't, this is heresy. I'll follow Michael Pearl. Okay, really? All right, then here's a little experiment for you. Go on out and get drunk and fornicate. Go hire a nice prostitute and see what the Lord does to you. See if there's any condemnation on your flesh. <laughs> Common sense stuff here, people. Let's finish up the... Stupid Satanist here. The full gospel. All right. I did it in about 15 minutes. We're done. I love my false preacher. He's wonderful. I love to hear false preacher. Well, you can just go ahead and do this guy then too. I mean, you might as well. Michael Pearl, Aleister Crowley, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Hey, man, you believe Jesus died for sin? Do what you want. <laughs> Why not? You know? So, uh, yeah. Uh, Pervert Pearl has been around for a long time, deceiving people with his sex manuals and lying about the Bible and everything else. Um, and it's just going to get worse. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other videos I've seen of his that are just false, and I just haven't had time to do anything about it. But I just wanted to put this thing together, put it out there. Um, if you hear about Michael Pearl, don't fall for the guy. He is a wicked heretic. Um, just disgusting. So that's going to be it. We'll see you in the next video.